い。Hi, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our development seminar by Dr. Hazeltine. Uh, the topic of our seminar is world class: the story of adversity, transformation, and success at NYU Longhorn Health. And uh, in our seminar today, we get to learn from none other than Dr. Hazeltine uh, about the turnaround story of New York School, New York University School of Medicine. Now, the team at NYU School of Medicine transformed. An unprofitable and a poorly ranked institution in terms of patient care, to an institution who became global leader in that particular sector, and that too in less than a decade. In this path to success, uh, there were careful changes that were being made at the institution level, and we have much to absorb for our own country, where healthcare still struggles to provide good patient care. So we really look forward to listening from Dr. Hazeltine. A little background about Dr. Hazeltine. He is. He has an active career in so many fields: in science, business, and philanthropy. He is currently the chair and president of Access Health International, a, um, a foundation he co-founded in 2007, and it has its footprints in United States, China, Singapore, uh, India, Netherlands, and Philippines. He has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed journals. The articles in peer-reviewed journals, and is、um, author of several books, including the latest that you hold in your hands, which is World Class. He is also a member of several advisory boards around the world, and he is known for his pioneering work in HIV/AIDS, cancer genomics, and has founded 12 biotechnology companies. And he holds many patents as well. So there is literally no area that has been not touched upon by him. So, and he was previously a professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, where he was the founder and chair of、uh, Division of Biomedical Pharmacology and Division of Human Retrovirology. Thank you so much, Ma, Dr. Hazeltine, for for being here. And we have Dr. Mudit Kapoor as our discussant today. He is an associate professor of economics at Indian Statistical Institute, and he holds a master's degree from Delhi School of Economics and a PhD from University of Maryland. He has formerly worked with as a consultant with World Bank, and he has academic papers which have been published in top journals like Journal of Econometrics, Review of Economics and Statistics, and Urban Economics, among many others. Dr. Kapoor is actually actively working in healthcare sector. Uh, where he has been instrumental in digitizing AIMS data. AIMS is a very large, for for people who might not be aware, is it's a very it's a one of the largest hospital in our country, and Dr. Kapoor has actually given important feedback to the team at AIMS、uh, to make patient care more effective and efficient. So I welcome you both, and、uh, the format of this particular talk is that the first 45 minutes, Dr. Hazeltine will will enlighten us about his. Findings and for 15, 10 to 15 minutes, Dr. Mudit Kapoor will、uh, provide his input. Thank you so much. Well, it's a、uh, special pleasure to be here.、Uh, amongst that overly long introduction,、uh, it was overlooked that I have been a board member of Brookings. For over 20 years, and on the executive committee of Brookings as well,、uh, it's probably not on the official bio, but、uh, it's been one of my great pleasures.、Uh, Vikram, who's sitting quietly in the back of the room, is a friend through Brookings,、uh, and I've come to be friendly with his、uh, family as well. So it's a、uh, a great pleasure to be here at Brookings India.、Uh, I met some of you on the Brookings trip through India, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, for all of us, I've been coming to India since 1966. So I've been tramping around here for a long time, you know, east, west, south, center.、Uh, and 1966 is a little different getting around India than it is、uh, today. I know some of you will remember the stories where you'd go to the airport, you call up and say, "I have a reservation." They say, "You do? Yes, you're number 87 on the waiting list." No problem. You'll get it. You'll have a flight. Or you're number 237. But I made my reservation three months ago. Okay, it was a revelation when things changed. I remember you had to hire a facilitator to get through the airports, and some of you will remember those days. And so it's been also wonderful to see India growth and change.、Uh, from the first drive in when I drove in, took the A bus in from Dum Dum Airport in 1966 was an experience I will never forget, and it actually has been important in 
helping me understand what the rest of the world is like and how privileged my life had been and uh, uh, help confirm my desire to use my energies to make life better for others. Uh, and as, as I say, it's, it's wonderful to see the progress as India has made. But the journey, as you all know, is far from over. Uh, healthcare isn't the highest priority for Brookings, but it is a priority. And I would like to see it assume even a higher role because the health of a nation is critical to every other aspect. And for some reason, that's escaped most development. You know, my great friend and, and uh, 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 sort of mentor in many of these issues has been Richard Holbrook, and I actually helped mentor him as well as regarding HIV AIDS issues. But he actually made a big difference by helping put health on the UN agenda. The fact that you have the Millennium Development Goals, the, uh, the, the future goals for sustainable development, and health is a critical part of those, is in large measure to Richard's inspiration in his work. Started with HIV AIDS and then continuing. Um, and health is now not fully incorporated into people's thinking about development, but it is a critical part. And I would always argue it should be even more of a part. One book I would like to write at some point is A Health-Centered City. Why is health so important for a city? And it's critical for city functions. And most people, even in the most advanced cities or planning cities, are, don't really think about it. They don't think about health service. They may think about environment. They may think about green. They may think about smart. But you read a book on smart cities, not a word about health. You read our own Brookings report, the wonderful book on, uh, um, what was it called? The Metropolitan Revolution. Health was not mentioned. Did you notice that? That health wasn't mentioned in that book on Metropolitan Revolution? It's important, and Shamaka is, uh, I'm sure, agreeing with these, these ideas. So uh, for all those reasons, I'm happy to be here at Brookings in Brookings, India. Let me say I'm going to talk about two books, actually. The new book is world class, and all of you are going to get a copy. And if you'd like me to sign it for you, I'll be happy to sign it for you. But there's an earlier book, actually now published by Brookings also. It's uh, published originally in India by Yatra Press, or a branch of Yatra Press. Uh, and it was just published in December by Brookings. It's called Every Second Counts. And it's about the emergency care system here in India that is saved by now three million lives. And it's a system I was shocked to find that most Deliites don't know about. Some people in this room might know about it, but I can tell you when I gave an introduction at the Jaipur Book Festival and there were 500 mostly Deliites there, five people knew about EMRI. They knew, five people knew about 108. And it's one of these real marvels of healthcare innovation. So let me talk about what unites these. But before I do that, let me talk about the background that led to these books. The background is I created Access Health International about 12 years ago with the help of Dr. Reddy in Hyderabad. And the way I began was having a meeting of very interesting physicians and uh, healthcare workers that was put together by CII and also with, uh, with Vicky. So we had a very interesting meeting. And in that meeting, I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Reddy and realize that he had a vision, more or less, that corresponded with ours, which was how to deliver high quality health to everyone, not just the middle class, but everyone. His was a unique way of doing it because it was through a for-profit hospital center. And that was thought to be very unusual. And I remember talking, he said, listen, if you're gonna be sustainable, you better have a profit. You can't build a, a growing, expanding operation if you don't have a profit. And if you're a government, you might be able to do it, but you might not do it. And, and so I found it a really interesting thinking. And we actually founded Access Health in Hyderabad in his office. I'm very happy to say that now, 12 years later, he's the director of our Indian operation. And it is a fully Indian foundation working in India. Everybody in it is from India. So we're not a foreign institute working here. We're an Indian foundation working in India with relationship to our groups in China, in the Philippines, in the United States. And so we 
look at the issues here, work with knowledge, detailed knowledge of the issues here, and then infuse what we've learned from other countries here and take lessons from here and help others. And so uh, what we are is a uh, hope to be a global thought leader in healthcare transformation and an organization that has an effective arm of helping either through advisory services or through consulting work help both the public and the private sector achieve their ends. And that's why I write these books to help this knowledge interaction. This is, I've actually in the last five years written six books, so I've been pretty busy writing. Uh, but the most two recent books are these, and they're interesting, in some, some lessons, uh, general lessons. Uh, I'm happy to say that the book World Class is now the number one bestseller in hospital administration on Amazon, even before publication. And it's a bestseller in leadership and management, because this is, at its heart, a business story, too. How you take it, it was, was introduced, how you take an institution that's doing well and, and transform it. What's the actual story that unites both of these? It's recognizing an unmet need or a big problem. I was very close to the whole process in which EMRI was developed. And a famous, you might say infamous leader, Ramalinga Raju, I knew during this time. I've known him since, and after he's come out of jail, I've talked to him again. He was a visionary leader who understood what the problem was. And it happened in India at a very interesting time when the political leadership had realized that there's things they could do to improve the health of the people of Andhra. And that was universal catastrophic health care coverage. That was the Arogashree program. And it was radical and fundamental and has inspired many changes, certainly throughout southern India, but also in the way the central government thinks. And if you're looking at Ayushman Bharat right now, it is inspired in part by that. It's catastrophic. Now, the Arogashree was very interesting because it was both public and private. I think Ayushman Bharat, Bharat is probably mostly public, but not exclusively public and not overtly public. So it's an interesting movement. And what the Arogashree didn't do is wellness centers. The big gap that still exists, is what are you going to do for the rural population? What are you going to do for the, the, the poor? What are you going to do for the peri-urban populations? There are now movements to try to do that. And I think that's the background from which this EMRI emerged. Very interesting background. With world class, there is a similarity because the first word in the, the, the story of what this is is a story of adversity. Most people don't do anything unless they're in dire straits. Most people are complacent to let things move along. And complacency is an enemy. It's an enemy in every place you find it. If people are content to do less than the best, you are likely to run into trouble. And certainly that happens all over the world, not just here. If people are content to have a system, health system that functions poorly. That's not acceptable. And so, but people generally don't activate unless there's a crisis. What was a crisis for NYU? Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is motivating. Uh, this was a, pri it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a not-for-profit private institution. And if you're going bankrupt, you have, you're out of business. But in this case, not only they were going out of business, they were joined at the hip, or let's say the pocketbook, with NYU itself, and the whole university was going to go bankrupt because they don't have a big endowment and it's not a public institution. If that's not motivating, I don't know what it is. So the first reaction was get rid of them. And they did that. They merged them out. But the faculties hated it, everybody hated it, it didn't work, they came back. Then they were desperate. Finally, they decided to, to take some bold changes in leadership, and they did that. One of the things that I focus on, and I think it's common to both of these, it's a business point. If you talk to most people about transformation in business, they focus on the CEO. And that's rightly so. The CEO has a responsible for doing, doing it. They don't focus necessarily on the board. 
And I can tell you from serving on many boards, boards determine what can happen. They set the parameters for whether you can be successful or not. The board not only sets the general parameters, but has to clear the way against resistance, which will occur no matter what you're trying to transform. You're gonna run into entrenched interests that you have to bully your way through. And if you don't have a powerful board leader working in tandem, or board itself, working in tandem with the CEO, you're sunk, you can't do it. And they're fortunate, there was a great combination. And there's actually a sub-lesson here. That board leader was there five years doing not much before the new CEO was found. A board leader can't do it himself, and a CEO can't do it themselves. So the whole section on the importance of the board, which I'd like to see emphasized more in the kinds of things you at Brookings think about, about leadership. Whether it's the equivalent of a board in the, in the public sector, or whether it's a board, actual board in the private sector, how the board must function to ensure transformation and positive change. And so that's a really important lesson in here. The next lesson for both of these is a question of, see, I'm trying to relate these two because they're, they're, they're quite different contexts, but um, the actual form that this should take. So in world class, the leader happened to be a radiologist. Radiologists by their very nature understand information and understand technology. And if you're a good radiologist, you're at the cutting edge. We just had a wonderful experience this morning where we visited a for-profit radi radi radiology group. The work that they were doing was unbelievable. I hadn't seen anything like it. Not because their equipment was unbelievable, but, but the way they were using information. For those of you who are doctors, and there may be some of the audience, I'll just tell you one of the things we saw that I couldn't, I think nobody has seen yet. That is, you might know what a PET scan is. Do you, any, people know what PET scans are, okay? You get injected with a hot radioactive isotope. My friend actually invented that. My other friend who was a congressman, a senator, actually allowed us to make little uh, cyclotrons, which are necessary, so you can have the radioactive materials are so short. In your life, you need a local cyclotron. Um, and it's very good for diagnosing cancer and other things. What they were able to show is you can actually use artificial intelligence to interpret CAT scans, and there's hidden information there that is almost as good as a PET scan. It was you know, completely eye-opening. That's the kind of thing that can happen here with radiologists. Well, this was a radiologist, so they understand um, a lot about instrumentation, and the key understanding that this CEO had was that Modern medicine can be practiced outside of the walls of hospital. Most surgeries don't need to be done in hospitals. That's a powerful realization. He realized that 12 years ago when he started the transformation, I can tell you every hospital in the United States now that's a thinking hospital, which isn't maybe 10% of them, are panicked about how they're gonna do outpatient care. Well, they went from four to 400 outpatient services. That means you go in in the morning and out at the night for open brain surgery, for total hip replacement, for knee replacements. Big operations. You can do most of it outside the hospital. Why is that important? Because the driving passion for both EMRI and NYU is patience. What are we going to do to give the patient the best experience, the highest quality, and the safest? Outpatient means it's convenient to a patient because it's close by. Outpatient means that it's safe. Everyone knows a hospital is probably the most dangerous place you can be, even in Delhi in the middle of traffic. You go to your hospital, it's more dangerous for you. You go to an outpatient clinic and there are not as many sick people and they're in and they're out and you're not there overnight. It's much safer and it's much cheaper. 95% of the profit and this is a good story because they went from losing money on $2 billion of sale to making a total of about, let's say, actually what they make on hospital operations is over $500 million a year on $7 billion. But they have to subsidize the medical school. 
So that gets them down to $250 million surplus. But then it gets made up because people like what they're doing in $200 million of donation a year. So they got $550 million to improve themselves, and they use it very effectively. So it's a complete business turnaround. But it's also a turnaround in quality and safety, and there are many lessons here in both books about how you improve the quality and safety. The first is the desire to do so. In my interviews, and this is based on 50 interviews, the head of quality and safety is the same when they were doing poorly as it is today. Same woman. What's the difference? When she went to the CEO before this change, he said, we're number 60 out of 90. We're not doing very well. He said, oh, I think we're doing just fine. That's complacency. The new CEO said, what can we do to improve? You tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay, And they did it. And now they're number one, two, or three. And then for three years in a row, they were number one in quality safety in the United States, up from the bottom third. That's an amazing transformation. And it comes from a focus and a desire. And it means there's a cultural change, a change from aspirate, from from complacency to aspiration, we can make a big difference. And if you ask them what is the most important thing they've done, they tell you it's a cultural change. But it was done, first of all, with a deep understanding of what medicine can do today. That's a lesson for India. It's a lesson for China. It's a lesson for everywhere. I go to China, and we have a big operation in China. I met the people who are the city builders, the guys who give the money to build their hundreds of cities of two to five million each, which they're now building. They have like model cities. They'll build, you know, and I visited these places. They're building huge cities for five million people out of nothing. Uh, and they're, of course, planning these cities. And what are they planning? Five and 10,000 bed hospitals. They're planning medical cities. Now, you in India have heard of medical cities. Terrible idea. You want small hospitals with peripheral care. You don't want a medical city where you concentrate everybody who's sick. That people have to travel a great distance. That's not what you want. You want something different from that. And you want it because you want to deliver high quality care to people. Now, the other thing that unites these two stories is the intelligent application of information science, our friend here. Okay? And why I say that is the world is littered with disasters in attempting to institute high quality medical information systems. You know, Harvard has spent $2 billion and it got nothing, and now it's spending another $3 billion to try to build a coherent medical system, and they won't do it. Singapore, for 10 years that I've observed that we have offices in Singapore, I've written a book about the Singapore healthcare system. Little Singapore, not even as big as Delhi, can't even put together a single coherent information system that unites all of their hospitals. Why? Not because they don't know how to do it technically, because they don't know how to do it organizationally. It's an organizational issue. If there's one thing that we would like to see here in this country and other countries, it's a uniform system of information that goes across the country. That's government needs to do that. It can't be done locally, and it can't even be done by local government. There are things that central governments must and have to do, and that is one of them. Whether it gets done or not, or how it gets done, you know, we tried it in the United States. My friend, who now runs a Commonwealth Foundation, tried it, David Blumenthal, for many years. Couldn't do it in the United States. And people will give you enormously inflated numbers of how much it costs. It actually doesn't cost that much. Uh, it is a big change in people's mind. That's what costs, the effort to change people's mind and how they work. But in both these systems, EMRI was founded by an information technology company. And it's hard. It runs as an information technology group, sort of like Uber. It is sort of the Uber of ambulances before Uber was Uber. Why does it work so well? Because they have absolute control over all the information. They know where the accidents are going to occur before they occur because they've studied the patterns. That's where they put their ambulances. They have a continuous cycle of improvement. They have the information. How many rings does it take to pick up the phone? How many rings does it take to pick it up at the other end of the ambulance? 
How many seconds does it take that ambulance to get moving? And was the ambulance where it should have been? Or was it somewhere else? How many minutes does it take to get to the site? And there's a continual cycle of analysis. What happens at the hospital and what does the patient think at the end of it? There's a continual cycle of information improvement by total information capture and analysis and research. Those are really valuable lessons. Same thing here. They created an information system that has some very unusual characteristics. Now, just by chance, Chandra Katandan, whom some of you may know, uh, Indra Nui's sister, is a business consultant. She got very interested, partly because they're interested in NYU and engineering, but just separately, she observed this whole process, and I've interviewed her. She said, I never saw an information system that's as comprehensive in real time in any business as this one. That's quite something, because big banks and big companies pride themselves on information. So what is the system they wanted to build and did build? It captures everything in one database. There is no separate database for anything that happens, whether it's trash collection, education, research, outpatient care, or inpatient care. They capture everything. And there is no interface between putting in the data and analyzing the data. Zero interface. So comprehensive. It's real time. So if you want to know how many patients are in each doctor's waiting room, you have that information now. You have how many minutes it takes for the transit through that system in real time. You, each person has a dashboard tailored to their performance indicators. They know where they should be on any of the key performance indicators. Do they get their patients out by noon? Do they have a low level of infection? Whatever it is, what is the rate at which their patients return? Whatever they need to measure, they measure. And by the way, they do that for their scientists too. Okay? Their scientists are held accountable just as their doctors are held accountable. How many papers do they publish? How many citations are there per, per, per publication? It's transparent. The bosses see it, and the people doing the same job see it. So if you're a professor, you see how many papers the guy next to you published, how much his grants are. And if you're a doctor, you see how many infections the guy doing what you're doing has. That's an important lesson. I mean, you, it's only modern information systems can give you that. Once you have that and you have these performance indicators, you have the data you need if you desire to, to improve the quality. You measure the quality, you can improve the quality. But they do something else. They do something called value-based medicine. What is the quality per cost? Quality has several aspects. Medical outcome, which can be standardized. It has safety, which can be standardized. And it has patient satisfaction which may vary whether you're in Minnesota or in New York City. We complain in New York City. They don't complain in Minnesota. Okay, but so that's a little variable. But you could quantitate the fixed and variable cost per patient. That allows you to do something else, which is very process and look at outcomes. It's the heart of value-based medicine. What are you getting? And this is a major other lesson in this book. Major the quality and the output, not the input, okay? That's what should be measured. That's a big, big change because that's not what goes on in much of the world. The accreditation agencies are measuring what you put in, not what you get out. People are getting paid for what they do, not what the result for their patient is. If you really want person-centered, patient-centered medicine, you want to focus on what the quality of the outcome is and the experience of the patient. My friend, Dr. Reddy, will tell you, as a heart surgeon or in heart operations, you may fix the heart, but the scar may, bar may bother the patient for the rest of his life. And he's going to be un less happy than he was before he had his heart repaired. So you have to focus on what that patient experience is. And you have to measure it, just like you have to measure everything else. That's how they got this fanatical focus on quality, how they got to be number one in quality and, uh, and uh, safety. 
all of these lessons, I think the same kind of lessons that you see here in uh, EMRI are, are applicable. I've asked them many times. I'm writing this book. You think others can do this. Right? You actually think others can get where you are. Maybe it's arrogance or maybe it's reality, but they say no. Okay, that's discouraging for me because my job is to help people learn. Why do they say no? They say because we know what kind of fanatical, obsessive, relentless focus you have to have to get any of these things done. And we don't see that relentless focus in other organizations. Because they're well past the time right now where they're desperate. They're making a ton of money. They're just as focused and just as aggressive in implementing what they, their vision as they were before. Their biggest new step was to give free medical education to everybody who was in, not only in the entering class, but everybody who was already entered. That's a big step. Why? They want to get different people to be doctors. And right now, you can measure the effect. Twice as many minority applications this year as last year. And in America, a minority application, maybe that would be a scheduled class application here, whatever you would call it. It's a big difference in the kind of people and what kind of doctors are going to come out of it. So those are the kinds of things. So I'm going to end here. There are many other lessons. For me, it's been a wonderful experience to work with these people and understand what they're doing. Talk to them as they were doing it. Talk to them about their successes and their failures and where they're headed next. They're headed to expansion, delivering different kinds of services, trying to create a new kind of uh, doctor that is basically taking a group of nurses and making them into family practitioners through a three-year education program. There's a lot of very interesting things they're thinking about in the future. But it's my hope that this book or these two books will serve as a basis to help others understand what is possible and as an aspiration, what could be done. And now I'm happy to interact with you on a different level. But thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I think this was a very splendid talk. And, uh, you know, we economists are a very skeptical beast. You know, we are skeptical about everything. You know, we are suspicious about just about everything under the sun. If somebody has good things to say, we look for intention. What are the intentions? If something has, somebody has something important to say, we are always twisting the argument. And the way, you know, when I was asked to discuss the book, I was actually a bit surprised. I mean, why would they ask me to discuss a book? I've just started some research in health economics. And this was actually, for me, a great learning experience. And I'll tell you, I'll approach this from, first from a philosophical perspective, and then I'll tell you what I learned from the book. You know, there are two schools of approach in research. You know, one is I call a very platonic approach, which is people who think they know the truth. So, you know, their job is because they know the truth, they have to tell others this is what the truth is. And the other is a very Socratic approach to research, which is you're a seeker of truth. So as a seeker of truth, you're always questioning. You sort of don't know. So through questions, you want to sort of understand and learn. And what I liked about this book is that this book, even though it's been written by a very accomplished academician, a person who's achieved uh, uh, great success in business life, he sort of proved to the world. But to see a researcher, I mean, who in spite could have taken the approach I know at all, is to go and seek and learn something. At the prime of his career, to me, is a very humbling and a very modest experience. I must appreciate it's a very humbling experience. I mean, the modesty with which the book is written, it does not claim necessarily that he has found solutions to US healthcare problem or the, or the world's healthcare problem. It's written with a genuine inquiry, I believe, which is something for me a first learning experience. That How should we approach a fundamental problem that here is an institution that was lagging? It is a single institution. The results might not be generalizable. So it seems like there's almost a childlike innocence out here 
to go out there and just learn from the people. Talk to the people who perhaps are his juniors, way down junior, juniors, both in terms of academics, both in terms of business leaders, but yet an approach to understand what happened out here. So I think that is, you know, when I looked at that approach from the book, it, you know, as I said in the beginning, that we economists are very suspicious people. You know, we don't take very kindly to people, you know, no matter how successful they might be on the books they have written. But when I looked at that approach, to me that was really the first lesson, I would say, in terms of academic, that I found a book which is about a genuine inquiry, a heartfelt inquiry into what happened out there. The second lesson, you know, coming to the hardcore lessons, which I learned, you know, I mean, this book, uh, I wish I, you know, I'll have to perhaps read it several times. But I think of it from an economics perspective why this book is important. Firstly, economics of healthcare is very, very complex. And why is that so? In fact, all our economic understanding, economic theories completely fail when it comes to healthcare. And why is that the case? Firstly, healthcare requires huge expenditure. So at one end, you require huge fixed cost expenditure. You need a hospital, you need a medical school, you need to provide training. But at the other end, the demand for healthcare can vary on a day-to-day -day basis. You just need to visit a hospital and you'll soon realize that demand and supply are not sort of interacting in the way economists typically think of it. So as a result, because of this huge fixed cost, typical theories in economics fail when it comes to healthcare. So therefore, as a result, to deliver opt what I would call smart healthcare, optimal healthcare, efficient, affordable, patient-centric healthcare requires tremendous amount of planning. And let me tell you, we economists are very suspicious about planning because, you know, somebody's intentions can be absolutely right. But if in the planning process, one of the moving parts don't behave in the way they should have, then the entire planning can completely fail, which is what makes healthcare for economists a sort of a very challenging sector to be working in. You know, it's a huge, it's a big sector to be working in. But the lessons which I understood over here, you know, the first thing, you know, which sort of uh, encouraged me in some sense or gave me some hope in sort of trying to understand this sector was actually something that I have deeply thought about when I started my research in healthcare, which, is, which has to do with measurability. In my opinion, if you ask me, the biggest public health crisis in India is we are not measuring health. If I were to go and ask a district magistrate in, of a 25 million more people who are staying in a district that what is the infant mortality rate in your district? Right now, the government of, government of India cannot answer that question. Leave aside at the village level, leave aside at the block level. If I were to go and ask them that have we made improvements in the state from one year to the other, they will not be able to answer this question. So in some sense, health, the neglect of health is very much reflected because there is what you use the term called ether of ambiguity or a data-free environment. All our healthcare policy in this country are being made in an ether of ambiguity and absolutely data-free atmosphere. So in other words, if you were to go even to the practitioners of health, and I'll give you some of my own experience. So my first task, so the first cry that I made in some sense in health economics was that everybody was talking about shortages of healthcare in India, even though we don't measure health, but everybody understood that there's a massive shortage of healthcare. But from an economics perspective, we always ask the fundamental question, which is, are we optimally utilizing the existing resources or not? So with that quest, both Shamika and I went to the district, uh, we started visiting the districts, we met chief medical officers of the district and we asked them that, look, this is the budget that has been given to you. Have you been able to utilize the budget? And we were shocked to learn that even though India's healthcare budget is 1.25% 1, 1 of the GDP, large part of it is unutilized. Because it's a very top-down approach, what the district or the village needs. And the people who are designing the program, there's a huge disconnect. And there is no accountability because there's no measurability. 
So when, when I read this book, the first lesson, I moved immediately to the leadership lesson. I think the first task to be able to objectively measure outcome, in my opinion, is a very fundamental discussion that we must be having in our public health care space. I'll give you another statistic which completely surprised both Shamik and I, who sort of working very extensively in this, is that you'll be shocked to know that in a large state like Bihar, which is estimated to have one of the worst neonatal mortality rate or infant mortality rate or any other health metrics that you would consider. Only 255 children death were registered. I mean, in that state, in a given year, almost one lakh children die, but only 255 deaths were registered. So as, as, as a result of it, the state doesn't even know why children are dying. You talked about the sustainable development goal that we are signatories to. But quite frankly, we don't even know which are the districts in which we need to sort of right now have a program to be able to make, meet these sustainable development goals. So this was sort of, to me, measurability or the lack of measurability in India's healthcare is a huge crisis. We are talking about various other big problems, but I still think that that still remains a problem. And I think Without this, designing healthcare policies is going to be a huge challenge. Having said that, you know, I, I decided that maybe I should approach uh, some institutions of repute. repute. So uh, we decided that we will go uh, to All India Institute of Medical Science. They had digitized their entire medical records. And at that point in time, you know, they were for the first time perhaps getting a proposal from an economist to look at the organizational structure to understand whether they are optimally utilizing their own resources or not. So as a result, the first task that we undertook was that we will just look at how many patients' capacity they have to see. And very often we have the impression that All India Institute of Medical Science is crowded, overutilized. So my first task was to see in how many days in a given year based on the capacity they have. How many days is it overutilized and how many days it is underutilized? And in fact, when for the first time we were presenting the data to the management, they were completely shocked because 70% of the times in some of the major departments, there was underutilization. So very often people will remember overutilization, but they forget that on most of the days there was underutilization. And it was not by design. It's not as if the doctors don't want to see patients. It's because of lack of measurement, they have a very faulty, in some sense, the management side. Now, I'll give, you, I'll give you where the problem essentially. The problem essentially is that people book appointments online. But the problem is that sometimes people book appointments but don't show up. So now, if you have a system which just closes, if they have capacity to see 200 patients, but if you were not to do the analysis that, look, if you give appointments to only 200 people and 50% is the probability that a person will not show up, then on most days you are going to have underutilization. So this is not a medical problem, but in some sense because of lack of measurement. Doctors typically remember the days when they are overutilized and they would go and complain that there's a massive shortage. But they forgot on many number of days that they have not met their targets as well. So that, in some sense, was an eye-opener to them. Then we started looking at length of stay. You know, very fundamental things. Length of stay, we found surprising result that there was a huge gender bias in the length of stay. Now, why is that problematic? Well, women were spending more time than men, very systematically. When you were controlling for comorbidities, you were controlling for various health factors. But again, this was an eye-opener because there was huge discrimination in terms of how women were being brought to the facility. Women were typically brought to the facility at much later stages of the disease as relative to men. So as a result, very often when we talk about measurability, this might seem like a very, very simple and obvious thing, but this is where I feel systems either are broken or the systems are made. So when I read this book, particularly the section on the leadership, when objectivity was introduced through data, I think to me that there's a great lesson out here. That it's not as if the CEO or the board wanted certain people to go, but the data was being utilized in a very positive manner to help people improve 
their own performance. It was to basically highlight, in some sense, that where is it that we are lacking and where is it that there is scope for improvement. So, but this was a very positive attitude, a positive will to look at the data because I feel that what the leadership brought along with the board was an aspiration to actually become the best. You see, very often you could be in a complacent system that even though individually people want to aspire, but if everybody around, or if there is an impression that the leadership does not really care, then everybody sort of mellows down. But with the change in the leadership, I think what happened in a big way, and this is sort of brought out, was that there was a change in the aptitude. A relentless approach by the CEO. In fact, there's one place where I read for four years, he was after a particular doctor to lead the department. I mean, this is completely relentless. I mean, he is a CEO of a billion dollar organization. Why does he have to care? But what it reminds me, even though he was his friend, is that when you are pursuing talent, then you have to be relentless. No matter how long it takes, if, it's, if he's the right person to be heading the department, then you need them. Now let me come as far as the good part, what I found very troubling in the book. The troubling part is that to a certain extent, what, in fact, Bill has been self-critical about it, that this can't be replicated. Now, this is to me very troubling because, for example, you know, it comes out in the book at various places that a certain, for example, even the, when the CEO says that I have an intuition to select the best talent, that is a bit problematic because if, suppose, they were not to get this intuitive CEO, I think the problem would have lingered on. You know, it's not like we are identified certain systematic things to change. But I think at some point what is troubling to me is this leadership. It became so dependent on the right leadership. And when we economists study institutions, when we look at growth, not only of institutions, when we look at growth of countries, typically we want to identify what are the five or six things that can be taken from one institution, one country, one firm to the other firm so that they can also grow. Now, in my opinion, when I hear something like that, it, it's, I mean, to, as an economist it is troublesome that how do we identify such leaders? I mean, in our country we are facing a health crisis. Because we have lived with this health crisis for so long, in fact today, you know, I don't know whether you're aware or not, our neighboring countries like Bangladesh and Nepal have much better infant mortality rate than India. And you will be surprised to know that 30 years ago, they were much worse than what uh, India is. So over time, they have improved drastically. India, on the other hand, has improved. But when you compare it to the neighbors, you're sort of puzzled that we've experienced growth, we've experienced digital uh, sort of, uh, 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 if you ask me, a digital awakening. We seem to be advancing. We are the fastest growing economy. But when you look at Bangladesh and Nepal, and now, Put it in another perspective, compare these two large states like UP and Bihar. You know, we recently used some data to construct these estimates of infant mortality rate and neonatal mortality rate. In certain districts, almost 7% of the children are dying before the age of 28 days. This is twice as high as the worst performing country. Sierra Leone, Pakistan are one of the worst performing countries. So in certain parts, certain parts of the country which have population of 30 million or more people, we have 7%, which is 70 out of 1,000 live births. That's the neonatal mortality rate. So now there is a health crisis. But you somehow or the other, because we are not measuring it on a periodic basis, we only get up when a major episode happens. For example, in a hospital, seven children died because of lack of hospital care. I mean, today in India, it is estimated that there are almost 400 children dying in certain states on a daily basis because of lack of adequate care. But because we don't have this measurability, unfortunately, it become, doesn't become a part of our national dialogue. And I think that is a big challenge. But I would seriously recommend anybody who is interested in understanding transformation. It's a general book of transformation. But the honesty with which the book is written, 
I mean, it's something for, for an academic, uh, you know, for me, that itself is a learning experience to go outside, interview people, right from the top leadership to the people who are involved in the change, and to just listen to them and honestly note down what you have heard is what this book is all about. So it's, an, it's in my opinion, very honestly written, and I'm very, very glad that you wrote it, sir. I think you also narrated your personal experience. He was also not only writing this book among friends, colleagues, but he was also a patient out there. So he, so he can tell you a lot more about patient care. You know, it's come from a, a personal experience than simply speaking to people or looking at just these rankings that have improved. So I'm very, very glad that I had an opportunity to, you know, uh, read this book, understand it, hopefully learn, you know, further from this. So thank you very much.